enough. Let's say the material that you're trying to assemble is too thin to actually thread. You don't have enough. You can't get a, a, a cap down or a leaf to be thin to actually cap. So what you're going to have to do is you'll have to install a rib nut and then do some thread to get the bolt into it. Years ago, we had a paraplegic student in the class, and in order to get him himself in and out of the vehicle, we had a strap that was attached to the roof of his car on the inside. Strap kind of gave way on it, so what we did was we used some rib nuts and we used a we threw the strap back into position and then we used the method to kind of assemble it that way. If they're blind, you should know that. You only have to have access to one side in order to install them. That's how it works. Is that the biggest advantage of a rib knot? Is that it's a, a really thin? What are you two? What are you two people doing? Paying attention. Uh, don't scroll on your computer. I'm just kind of curious to see what kind of things you got on your computer right now. I was up on the board. Okay. Maybe that's one. Um, what is it? It's a uh, Facebook post from the board. How does that my computer up? How does that kind of relate to what we got up here? Would you mind putting that stuff away? Sure. If you want to look at that stuff, it's okay outside of class, but I kind of find it um, distracting to what, what I'm doing. You want to take some notes on what we're doing? I have my notes. Open them up to your notes. <clears throat> this is literally what I have left. Right. Okay, you kind of see what a rib nut does. It gives way a thread of gold and you can put a screw or a bolt into it. There's the tool for installation. It's a fully manual, but it screws up into the threads of the rib nut in order to kind of get it. There's a couple different varieties of tools that are used for it. And here's another installation of it. This one uses a, a contact type of tool for installation. Hello, welcome to PCIT's Amplevel3.com. Today we're going to show you how to install rib nuts. What are rib nuts? Rib nuts are a combination of a rivet and an anchor nut. And they accept commonly threaded deviation hardware. Rib nuts are white after and no backside access is required. Rib nuts rely on notches in the skin to be able Once installed, rib nuts can accept commonly threaded aviation hardware. Drill. Deburr. Notch the bowl or use needle files. Thread the rib nut on the tool. Use the installation tool to pull the rib nut. Remove the installation tool by twisting the knob at the back end. <coughs> Alternate installation tools also produce good results.
either tool will squeeze or set the rib nut in place. And that's about all for rib nuts for now. Uh, join us again at mlittlefree.com for another subject. Bye. What you saw was the installation of what they call a keyed rib nut. It's got a projection on the underside of the head. What's the reliability on that? Well, it's it's hollow. What I can tell you is that if you don't have a, any type of printed caster in the rib nut in this installation, it doesn't have any sure strength. But it's used if we want to attach another piece of metal directly to it and it won't for that purpose. So they're hollow. Yeah. For those two rib nuts? Do you have to compensate for that? There's size based on whatever type of caster goes into the threaded section. We can get them in either 632, 822, 20 by 20, whatever size the threaded caster goes into the threaded section. The, the tool that's used to install them, the manual has to match that size. But if it threads into the rib nut more, it'll form a bolt upset on the opposite side of the rib nut. But uh, anyway, that's how it kind of works. Uh, I install one or two of them in the shop to kind of show you how they work, but they're very simple. Some of them are flush, others have a, a protruding head on them, and some of them also are steeled on the ends of them. So uh, if you want to use them like, for example, in float assemblies or where the, the inside of the structure has got to be liquid or gas tight, well, this prevents the leakage of the gas and the liquid from the other side of the valve. So there's a lot of different styles of them. Some of them open, some of them are closed. Uh, this was the common method that was used to install the ICER boots in aircraft. The ICER boots are uh, made of rubber, but they've got an edge on them uh, that allows uh, for the installation of a screw through the edge of the, of the boot. So uh, this kind of shows you how they use them. That bead has got a hole in it, and what we do is we position the boot bead with the hole in it over the aircraft skin where the rib nut is at, and then they use a fairing strip down the boot, inch down the boot and inch down the length of the wing. Uh, this is before they installed new um, adhesive to install pneumatic boots in non aircraft. And the innovator in this was Via uh, Goodrich, and Via uh, uh, Goodrich uh, for installation of it. But um, uh, later on, they came up with an adhesive that were probably um, satisfactory for, assembly, for installing uh, the ICER boots in aircraft. So the original installation kind of looked like this. But they're used for a lot of other purposes as well. Again, if you've got very thin metal that won't, you know, can't gap to directly install a screw or a bolt, this will kind of give you another option. So that uh, you, you've got at least threaded, a threaded hole after you're done. Sometimes rib nuts are identified by grip by gashes that are on the head of the rib nut. So by looking at the gashes on the head, you can kind of figure out what grip range might be appropriate. Here's a chart that came out of a 6515. So what it's showing you is the maximum grip range is based on you know, what it has, what the radial gashes are on the head of the rib nut, the plane that you've got. So to kind of give you an idea, this one is sized for a uh, maximum uh, 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 grip of 04075 and a minimum grip of 04045. And again, the idea is to have a, an area that the arm that's going to be pulled from the bullet and we're not going to um, damage the rib nut with the material if you select the correct grip range when you use it. You have to be kind of careful, too, when you install these things because in many cases you can't see what's happening on the underside where they're being, where they're being installed. So the installation instructions usually tell you how many turns on the installation tool you have to make in order to be able to form a sufficient bolt pad on the back side of it to won't come out of the hole after it's installed. If you turn too many times with the installation tool, there's a danger of stripping the threads out on the back side on the heat rib nut because you're just putting too much stress on it when you're trying to pull it. So again, um, what I would recommend doing is if you can uh, construct something that has a, a identical thickness of what you want to install it in, if the insta original installation you can't see the back side of it, what I would recommend doing is uh, using the tool on a piece of scrap material that you can see what's happening on the back side. And then you can kind of uh, replicate that on the structure that you're trying to install. So, 
this is a, a key grip nut, and again, not all of them have it, but uh, when they get loose, it's a problem, and the, the, the manufacturer came up with an anti-rotation device on top of it. And what you have to do is you have to prepare the aircraft's grip in by making a notch in the pin. So they have notching cutters that uh, make kind of a U-shaped notch allowance for something to the hole. And what that does is it secures the key in position so it makes it so it won't rotate. When these things do get loose, if they're not a key grip nut, you know what's going to happen. When you start to loosen the screw that goes in the center of it, it's going to spin. So again, this was their uh, attempt at making a kind of a, um, an installation where the rib nut, uh, if it does get loose, is not going to spin. It's going to try to uh, lose, lose its in the, in the threaded section of it. What I would tell you, too, is this. If you have to cut notches in the skin, you want to cut the notch so that if there's a near edge that uh, is present on the structure, we don't want to have that notch aligned with the near edge of the structure. Because if a crack develops, it's going to cause separation of the material. So if we have to cut notches, we cut it away from the edge of the material. And if a crack develops, hopefully it's going to run inboard rather than run to the edge and cause the material to, to separate. So there's, there's generally a behind that when we, uh, uh, when we have to prepare it. Also, what I would tell you, too, is the notchers are very expensive. My price went out uh, years ago, and they run about $300 or so. And I'd like to have it and have that tool, but it's just not worth making the investment to just demo how the tool works. But just know for the key grip nuts, you're going to have to have a notch cutting tool, a notcher that actually uh, notches the material before you can install the grip. The heading tools, they kind of vary to install them. There's ones that they use in a factory that are pneumatically driven. They just have a mandrel on the end of them. And uh, you squeeze the trigger, and what it does is it just uh, forms a bolt head on the, on the rip nut. The compact tools usually come with a set of instructions so that uh, what we do is we turn the wrenching flats that are on the tool a certain number of turns, and it'll provide the adequate number of, of the pull that you find on the bottom of the rip nut. With the standard uh, type of heading tool, you have to uh, squeeze and turn that, uh, you have to squeeze the lever and turn the hand crank a so many times in order to get the proper um, head that you need on the back side of the material. Again, uh, the object of the game is always to practice on scrap material because if you can't see what's happening on the other side, it's possible that you can strip the threads out if you want to do it or not have enough of a bolt head on it so that it's not secure in the structure. So, uh, so that's the idea. Here's the uh, uh, installation instructions for the, uh, for the compact version. So for example, if we're installing ones designed for A32 screws, if we've got very uh, thin material, you're only going to turn the wrenching flat on the tool about one and a half turns. And for very thick material, um, you're only going to do the three quarters of a turn. Any more than that, then you, again, you risk stripping out the, the threads on the rip nut. So we got to be careful. Um, you can see how you can use it. They've got two pieces of material that might have been too thin uh, individually or even combined to really cap uh, to put that screw into if you're going to put it like an L-shaped bracket on top of it. But uh, since what they've done is they've created a threaded hole, they now have some support in order to kind of get the screw into the hole. So that was kind of the big advantage that they came up with there. So that's how it's actually installed. Uh, there's all sorts of different codes that are, they use for the rib nuts, but let me give you an example of maybe a code for one. Something like this, uh, a code for it, NES or the International Aircraft Standard. This particular number indicates that there's going to be a protruding flathead near this, so it sticks up proud of the material. Uh, the A is probably a material code, so it's going to be made out of 6053 aluminum. This gives, tells me it's going to be a 6, uh, 632. I think. The T tells me it's going to be a key grip nut. It's got the projection on the bottom side of the rip nut. The B tells me it's going to be a closed end on the bottom of the rip nut. And the last uh, grouping of numbers gives me the grip range of that rip nut. So this would be for an 075 maximum grip. <coughs> so you kind of have to be familiar with how the numbering system works for the part numbers. You can see that there is rhyme and reason to the way that it's kind of numbered uh, for identifying it. 
What I can tell you is this, if you can get an inspection in, your, in order to view the, the back side of the material after you install them, please do that. Because again, if you're trying to do it in a blind installation, and there's uh, no other way you can't completely see it, find an inspection hole or carry on the aircraft and see if you can make it in the air. You at least inspect them from the back side to see what they kind of look like. Uh, also, too, if you have to remove them, let's say they're not a key drive, you're driven up and you have to remove them. The only advice I have for you is to maybe find something like a wedge underneath the head of the rib nut, and then you can drill through the head in order to, to kind of get it out that way. That's about the only thing that I can kind of give you advice on. But uh, they're sometimes difficult to remove. And also, the debris after, after you remove them. If it's in a blind installation, you're faced with the dilemma of trying to get out the afterwards, so do the best that you can. You don't want to leave any of the old rib nuts behind after you put a new one in. Another type of special fastener. Well, I don't know if you're aware of it, but on a lot of cowling and inspection covers, they use quarter turn fasteners. One type of quarter turn fastener you might find in aircraft is called a Zeus fastener. And um, I've got a sample of them. I don't have one installed on a panel, but I'll show you the individual piece parts that make up the Zeus fastener. With a lot of them, it's a three-piece type of assembly. You've got a, uh, a thing that looks like a spring that's really part of a receptacle, and that's a, attached to the fixed structure that you're attempting to assemble with a, a cover. So you've got a spring and some rivets that secure to the bottom side of the skin structure. The top side, or the cover of what you're trying to attach to the bottom part, has got a stud in it, but there's a cam track that's a part of the stud that uh, you're going to follow when you screw it down, and it latches onto the spring. So when you assemble these two parts together, what you end up doing is you end up turning the, the stud, and the stud has got a kind of a, um, a cap on it that follows the, the um, receptacle. And in the bottom of the, uh, of the stud, you're going to find kind of a, a flat section or a rounded area. And you can actually hear the, the fastener click into position when it's closed. These are commonly used on a lot of uh, covers for aircraft inspection covers and also on cowling. They're called quarter turn because it only takes a quarter of a turn in order to loosen or, or close them or to undo them and close them. I'll pass around a sample of one of them. Um, sometimes, too, uh, the stud has been countersunk, so if you have uh, if you have a gimbaled installation in your aircraft, you have to have a flush fastener. They make flush varieties of these as well. And uh, so this is an example of uh, the stud assembly, and this is a grommet that's installed with it. The grommet is what keep, uh, keeps the stud captive. So in other words, there's a tool that uh, wedges this into position on this side of it. So even though the, the stud is part of the removable assembly, it's part of the cover, what keeps it captive in the cover is really the grommet to keep it from coming up out of the hole after it's been detached from the uh, part of the structure. So this is the uh, stud and the grommet, and this would be the receptacle. And again, there's a lot of different varieties of these things, but uh, this is a, a fairly common one. So that's what they look like. Oh, by the way, too, this is the tool that's used to uh, undo them once they've been installed. There's a common name for that kind of tool. It fits the recess opening that's in the, the top of the stud. So does anybody know the name of that tool? It's called a Snoopy tool. Oh. <laughs> A lot of people will just use a common slot screwdriver, but really the recess that you find in the head has got kind of a contour, so it matches either one of the two sides of the tool in order to undo them. And that's called the Snoopy tool. This is the idea behind it, you know, I can't make a better drawing. So what the cover would have, it's got the, the stud on the ground on one side of it, and really what retains the stud is really that squished collar in position. And what goes on the fixed part of the structure is going to be the receptacle, it's like a spring. And again, there's a lot of different tools required in order to install these things. When you put the two parts together, it looks like that. And sometimes you can even hear um, when it is properly latched because you'll hear a click sound as soon as the stud falls into the recess uh, of it. 
this one will reset so the uh, I should say the receptor will fall through and reset down the side. Another thing too, if you have to install these types of port of turn fasteners, they're not just installed haphazardly where the receptacle is just as in, uh, indexed anyway on the structure. What you would want to do is you would want to install them with a specific joint in mind. You would want to have it installed so that when all of the studs are put properly positioned, all of the slots that are in the head of that fastener all face the same way. Why would that be an advantage to you? Right, you can see if one of them has been left on top. So again, you know, uh, in order to get the alignment of the receptacle to be just right, what they use is a drill key, a drill and index guide in order to properly install the receptacle so that uh, the, it will index all of the, uh, the studs so that they're properly aligned. So again, that's it. The FAA has two or three written test questions that I want you to remember regarding Zeus fasteners. The first thing that they're going to ask you is they want you to know about the diameter of the stud. For some strange reason, they've got a fixation about how the stud diameters are measured. What I want you to remember is that the diameters are measured in 15th of an inch increments. So if we look at the studs, uh, the stud, we can go back a slide or two and I'll show you. The stud diameter is measured in 16th of an inch increments. And also, they want you to know that the length of the stud is measured in hundredths of an inch. So if we were to look at the length of them from the bottom of the head to the where the hole is at that the receptacle kind of latches into, it's in hundreds of an inch increments. That's indicated on the head of many of the of the good nut or of, of the Zeus fasteners. That tells us that it's going to be a flush head. The six and a half, even though the diameters are in sixteenths of an inch, this particular stud measures thirteen thirty seconds of an inch in diameter, so it's six and a half. And the length of this particular one is a half of an inch long. So that information is present on the head of the Zeus fastener. So what I want you to remember, the body diameter is measured in sixteenth of an inch increments. The stub length is measured in hundreds of an inch increments. And, uh, and that's pretty much it. Okay? So I hope that you remember that. To give you an idea of the tooling that's required to install these things, it's complex and it's expensive. <coughs> have to install Zeus fasteners, my advice to you would be to try to borrow the tools from somebody that has them. There is going to be maybe one or two that you have to install. It doesn't uh, pay for you to purchase the tooling because it's hundreds of dollars to, to buy a tooling set. In many cases, you have to have special tools that are required to stretch the collar around the stud. You also have to have dimpling uh, guides that are necessary to dimple. It's going to be a flush type of installation. So it doesn't really pay to buy the tooling if you're going to be back and you can uh, borrow it from somebody. Other than that, really I can't tell you too much more, but the tooling is somewhat expensive to employ. Uh, there's another variety of quarter turn fastener that's called a cam lock. And these are probably more common. These are also quarter turn fasteners. But what you have for the part that goes into the cover is a, is a stud assembly. And it's got a cup with a spring in it and a stud. And there's a cross, uh, there's a cross beam that's, a, that's for, uh, positioned in the stud as well. The grommet is used for the same idea as it is on the Zeus fastener. When we install this in the cover, the grommet is swigged or at least locked in position that it makes the, uh, the stud assembly somewhat captive in many of the installations. The receptacle is usually a solid piece of metal that's got a, a cam track down at the bottom that engages the cross pin of the stud so that when you turn the, the stud into position, the cross piece of the camp of the, of the stud climbs an incline on the back of the receptacle and locks into position. So it's probably more common than the Zeus fasteners. So um, to give you an idea of what, what one looks like, it looks kind of like that. This particular receptacle is what we would call a floating receptacle. So sometimes there's an alignment problem in trying to get the cover to close on a lot of structures. Uh, you can you can use the uh, receptacles that look like this. They, they have a little bit of wiggle in them, so that it provides for an, some alignment issue that you might have in, in a fastener. So um, uh, it, it's got it's a floating type of fast, a floating type of receptacle. To kind of 
kind of show you where they're used. This is the backside of a of an access door where one has been installed. So you can see the receptacle has been used, and the, the uh, stud has got the uh, encrustment on it. It's already primed and bracketed, and uh, so it's in position. And uh, again, they're actually pretty simple. Let me pass around one to kind of show you what they kind of look like. Um, but they're they're fairly common for aircraft when you have to have an inspection cover that you have to kind of close out. Here's a stud and a, a receptacle, and I can, this one is uh, kind of loose enough where I can kind of palm it out of position, but you can see how it works. So this is a stud assembly and a receptacle, and that's a floating receptacle as well. Okay. And that's what it looks like. Okay, how about installing these things? Well, I can tell you they're a pain in the butt to install as well. So you're going to have to have specialty tooling in order to install them, and you have to usually have an indexing guide or a drill guide in order to properly index the receptacle. So the object of the game would be to have all the slots, the common slots that are in the head of the stud, aligned the same way when the cover or, or the towel is closed. So um, it's not just as simple as just kind of drilling holes and putting the stud in when you have to kind of plan how the receptacle is going to sit in order for the installation. Also, too, once you get the grommet installed in the, in the cover, there has to be a tool that's used in order to compress the spring and the cup, the cam lock, in order to leverage it inside of the hole. So they use a pair of pliers that are called cam lock pliers, and they're really simple. All it does is it allows you to compress the spring and the cup of the cam lock so that you can tilt it to the side and then uh, get it into the hole. So if you don't have that tool, it's impossible to install the, the cam lock into the cover with your cam lock pliers. They look a lot like Cleco pliers, but it just allows you to squeeze the spring and the stud and the, and the cup so that you can get it inside of the hole. And that's the cam lock pliers. Uh, again, that's kind of how it works. So you can see, uh, normally if you don't have the tool, you don't have enough uh, lever, you don't have enough distance in order to be able to um, Kind of wiggle the, the rest of the stud past the grommet. That's what they use for that. Okay. Uh, sometimes they've got, uh, this is one that's already been installed. And again, this shows you the installation of a grommet assembly. So this would be looking at the back side of the cover with the stud installed. And you can see the cross spring that's in it. And again, it's being held captive really by the grommet on that side of it. Some of them don't use a grommet. It's just that they just use the cross pin being larger than the diameter of the hole. And that prevents the, the cam lock stud from coming out of the hole. But others, are, in fact, do have a grommet on the, on the back side of them. This shows that the installation tool is uh, a, um, a drill guide that they use for installation. So uh, once you get the, the location for um, where the cam lock has to go, uh, what you do is you use the pins that are provided in it in order to locate where the, uh, the center of the hole is going to be for the cam lock. The two side holes are used for um, indexing where the attaching hole for the receptacle has to go. So they use the, you know, the drill guide to install the, the receptacle to that. Okay. And again, some more pictures. This is showing the front side of the cover. Okay. To give you an idea, these would be typical tools you might use for installation of them, but again, just the same advice I have for installing the uh, fasteners. Uh, if you can borrow the tools, if you only have to install one of them, try to borrow the tools because they're generally fairly expensive. One more style of quarter turn fastener is called an airlock. These are usually made out of stamped sheet metal, either uh, stainless steel or aluminum. And I'll give you, I'll show you a sample of what those things kind of look like. They're kind of uh, flimsy looking, but they do work. The receptacle uh, uh, has got a, a track in it. You can kind of look to see how this thing works. But uh, you've got a cross, or I should say a stud assembly that's got a cross pin in it. And that's what the receptacle kind of looks like. And uh, they work the same way that these fasteners do, or cam locks. You turn the fastener a quarter turn to either lock it or unlock it. The installation of them is a little bit different, though. In order to install these, the cross pin is the part that you push out in order to get the pin to get into the cover. And uh, then you push the pin into position in order to um, uh, provide for the cross pin in it. So the cross pin is kind of a separate part. Okay. 
kind of give you an idea of how they're installed. Um, here's what the pin looks like with the cross pin in it, and here's the receptacle. This thing is obviously riveted to the aircraft structure as part of the, the fixed piece, and the cross pin that's in the stud is really separate from the prior installation. Once we get the, uh, the stud into the cover, you use a tool in order to uh, press the, the cross pin into position. And for any, re for any reason, if you had to remove that stud assembly, you're going to have to use a, a tool to kind of uh, push it out of the, the hole that's in the stud in order to kind of take it out. But um, generally, that's how they work. It's called an airlock fastener. So those are the three different varieties of quarter turn fasteners. You've got snooze fasteners, you can have cam lock, and you've also got airlock fasteners. One isn't any particularly better than any other, it's whatever the airframe manufacturers install. Uh, some of the cam lock fasteners are high strength varieties, but uh, they're essentially not all as quarter turn fasteners. So you're just able you're able to take a panel or a cover off kind of quickly by kind of turning it a quarter turn. Um, that's that. How about this? Well, I think Lonnie Bosselman demonstrates the installation of one of these in the lab. It's a helicoil. Helicoil is actually a trade name. Um, there are other manufacturers of this type of device, but uh, probably the most common one is helicoil. If, uh, for example, you've got material that is naturally too soft to cap, or you just kind of cap with a standard cap, or possibly you damage a threaded part, this can be used as an insert in order to give you threads that you can put a fastener into. Years ago, I had to repair a, uh, a meat cutter for a restaurant. The, the adjusting nut on the meat cutter for controlling the uh, slice of meat that's being, that's being cut, it had been uh, threaded and unthreaded so many times that it damaged the threads in the, in the, uh, in the meat cutter. So I drilled out the hole, and what I did was install the helicoil that uh, now gave me new threads that I could put the, uh, the adjusting knob in. So, but most of the helicoils are made out of stainless steel. If you look at them in cross section, they've got kind of a diamond cross section. And there's a reason for that. When you install them in a hole, what you have to do is you have to cap the hole in order to thread it into the hole. Then after that's been done, uh, you use the inner section in order to kind of support the screw or the bolt that goes into the center. So in order to get it into the hole, you, you first have to drill the hole, you have to gauge it, and you have to thread it right, right, with a special cap that is not a common size cap. And then you uh, install it into the hole. To get it into the hole, to lock into the hole, there's a drive hang on the back of the, on the bottom side of the helicoil. We use something that looks kind of like a screwdriver, but it's got a slot in it. And what they do is the, um, you turn the, uh, uh, that tool that engages that hang on the drive, drive hang of the helicoil, and you thread it into the threads that you've already created in the hole. I've got a sample of um, one of these someplace here. Okay, dude, here's a huge one to kind of show you what they look like. But uh, here's a helicoil. I have uh, several of them that were given to me by uh, one of the workers at San Onofre. When they were constructing the nuclear power plant there, they, they were as big as slinkies. I don't know what applications they were using them in, but they come in all different sizes, you know, depending upon the fastener that they might be used for. But uh, in any event, uh, that's what they kind of look like. Notice also that there's a brake notch in the uh, near the drive tank area of the helicoil. When you turn this thing and thread it into the hole, eventually that drive tank is going to break down. So um, it's kind of something you have to think about as well. Where that drive tank goes is kind of important. Uh, if you were installing these things, maybe a combustor can of a, of a gas turbine engine, you certainly wouldn't want to leave the drive tank inside of the, inside of the combustor tank. So what Lonnie does is kind of an interesting trick. On the installation tool, he uses a little bit of wax. So um, what happens is when the drive tank eventually fractures and breaks away, the wax kind of captures it and he very carefully extracts it without losing the drive tank inside of the aircraft engine. So uh, anyway, that's there. Uh, where, what other applications might they be used for? Occasionally, in some automotive applications in the old days, where a 
spark plug had been ripped out or a spark plug a crossover unit had been ripped out. And occasionally they used a helicoil as a replacement. It's not necessarily approved for use in aircraft, but for sometimes in automotive use, sometimes what they'll do is they'll um, a stripped out credit pool for a wash or a spark plug and be replaced with a helicoil. Personal advice or, uh, that I have with these things, they don't use standard uh, drills for installation. When you buy helicoils, you pretty much have to buy a kit that gives you a, a special a drill in <coughs> diameter that's size for the helicoil. So you can't run to Home Depot and get a drill that will work for installation. It's true the thread size on the inside of it is, is it, whatever it is, 632, 832. However, the, the diameter of that helicoil is special, so that means that you're going to have to have a special drill for installation. So you have to use a kit. Also, too, some of the helicoils are what they call a mid-drip helicoil. In order to provide for the bolt or the, the screw that goes in the center of the helicoil to be somewhat captive and not uh, come out, what they do is they have kind of a self-locking feature in the center of the helicoil. It's kind of a, of a rubberized piece of material, and it works kind of like as an elastic stop nut, like an AMP 65 stop nut. So uh, as you thread the, uh, the screw the fastener in, there's a bit of resistance or friction that holds the uh, fastener in. So they call that a mid-drip helicoil. Commonly on the mid-drip helicoils they're identified. You can tell that they're a mid-drip style. They're usually color-coded red. And that usually tells you that uh, it's got a, a section on it that will help maintain the screw or the bolt when it's used in uh, insulation. 